Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. So first of all, I gotta apologize to my sister. Uh, she never wants to hear about Bayes' theorem again. There was actually algebra and she said, what are you thinking? What, what are you thinking? So I'm sorry, Janet. There will be no Bayes' theorem, no algebra today. But there is a lot of looking at other countries. I always get a kick out of this. Let's look at the UK versus Italy this week. UK and the US, we're doing poorly. Botswana is like better than the United States in their management and Italy is way better than UK. So how did the United Kingdom get it so wrong? You might ask yourself. They've got 67% of their population vaccinated. We talked about herd immunity with the Delta virus. You have to be at least 85%, maybe higher. But you remember them? <laughs> they announced Freedom Day from the virus, July 19th. And they are a mess ever since. You should never declare freedom from a virus when the virus doesn't know. So why did Italy get it right? Remember Italy? I mean, Italy was a mess. Padua, the first major city in Europe, totally infected, overwhelmed. They, you know, a lot of criticism of the, of, the, of the leadership. They are now farther ahead in vaccination. 68% of the country vaccinated, 75% at least one, one dose. But the big difference is they followed Lilly's five-point plan. And in fact, they initiated vaccine passports right there in August. And look what happened. They totally blunted their surge. So let's, let's give Italy some credit. You know, we're always laughing about it. Italy, they can't manage their way. Well, they did, they're doing great. Uh, and, you know, Prime Minister Draghi is, is, should get a lot of the credit for it, you know, while the, while the Japanese Prime Minister is leaving because of that. This guy's doing a great job. Uh, and what he's done is really uh, impose stringent public health measures. And in August 6th, my favorite thing, he did what Lily suggested. He instituted the Green Pass, which is Italy's version of a vaccine passport. And you have to show that to attend large events, to dine indoors, to access gyms, anytime where there's clustering of people, you have to show your Green Pass. And what that does is it confirms that you have tested negative for the virus in the last 48 hours, you have been fully vaccinated, or you, you have recovered from a case of COVID. So they're really taking it very seriously. And they have a goal now of trying to get 80% of their population vaccinated by the end of September. Wouldn't it be great if we were doing that here? You know, and as also part of Lily's plan, you have to wear masks and social distancing when you're indoors. And they are imposing social distancing even when outdoors. And when it's not possible to maintain social distancing outdoors, they, they said you should wear masks. So they're really taking it very seriously. And for tourism, they've opened up their uh, country to tourism. But you have to show that you have proof of vaccination or, and a negative COVID test. And another part of Lily's plan, they are requiring uh, teachers, school staff, and students at the universities and schools to show proof of vaccination. That's why they are doing so well. <laughs> it's not that hard. It just takes a will to do it. You know what else is doing better? Brazil. Brazil was the worst country in South America. Well, look at this. This is a map of vaccination status. They're now leading for vaccination. They have really focused on it, and you can see their case number dropping like a stone. So it really is amazing. Well, how are we doing in the U.S.? Not as good as they are. 56% uh, vaccinated, and you can see we're sort of coming down, and everyone's happy about that, but we still have a lot of cases. Last week, we were averaging over 100,000 cases per day. We've reached 44 million total cases that we know about, and we know that it's probably four times more than that. So about 150, 60 million people in the United States have probably been infected. Last week, we were running 2,000 uh, deaths per day, and we reached a really horrible new milestone, which is 700,000 deaths in the United States. And there are new hot spots now, the, really the upper uh, northwest, and, and Alaska, Alaska suddenly has turned in a giant hotspot. And, and this is really interesting, came out of the uh, MM, came out of the CDC, the MMWR. If you look at, um, you know, hospitalizations, it's still mostly in the age group 70 and over, 60 and over. So while they're not getting the, most of the infections, they still are most of the hospitalizations, which is why the booster recommendations are for people over the age of 60, because they still are accounting for most of the hospitalizations. 
And if you look at just over the years, deaths from wars, epidemics, attacks, disasters. You know, the Vietnam War is 58,000 deaths, World War I, 116,000, World War II, 400,000. The 1918 uh, Spanish flu, 675,000, and AIDS, HIV AIDS, 700,000 from 81. COVID-19 now leads. We've now had more people die from all the wars put together and from AIDS. It's over 700,000. And because we're not going to reach herd immunity anytime soon, you can fully expect it that we will eventually hit 800,000 deaths. Texas, still pretty variable. Shout out to our friends in Dimmick County. They're doing pretty well. And the Texas Medical Center, things are getting better. You can see the last week we averaged about, uh, first the first time, under 2,000 cases per day. But that's, you know, I keep saying, when, when there are 40 cases a day, I'll feel comfortable. And we averaged just under 200 admissions to hospitals a day, 174. So let's talk about vaccine effectiveness, because I still get a lot of questions. Are they really effective? <laughs> I mean, yes, they are, but I'll continue to show uh, data that, that proves it. So there were three large studies that came out, the IV study, Supernova, and Vision study. Uh, the IV study was combined Pfizer and Moderna, Supernova was a VA trial, and the Vision study was emergency departments. And what they showed is over the last six months, no, no matter really what vaccine you got, 85 to 90% effective at preventing hospitalizations. And the emergency room study is actually worth looking at because this was done really when Delta was emerging as the dominant variant. It combines nine uh, states' data, and it looks at the percentage of people or hospitalized who showed up at the emergency, uh, emergency room with COVID. So if you're unvaccinated, about 19% were admitted to the hospital. If you were fully vaccinated, it was about 3%. So 19 versus 3% of being admitted. And the, you know, which one you got isn't all that big a deal. Pfizer was a little bit 3.2%, uh, Moderna was better, 24 and J&J &J was 6.5%. But the main thing is huge difference between hospital admissions if you're, if you're um, vaccinated or not. And this is another publication from the MMWR looking at weekly trends in cases and hospitalizations and deaths. The blue line is people who are vaccinated. The dark line, black line is people who are unvaccinated. So, you know, huge difference. You can see that there are increases in cases of people who are vaccinated. We expect that. We don't expect 100% protection. It's more like 85 or 90%. So cases are rising. There are infections happening. But it, hospitalizations are not up, as we showed in the other study. And deaths are really you know, protected if you're vaccinated. So a couple of updates on the boosters. Uh, you know, one of the real concerns that the FDA was looking at for the third dose was whether or not it would increase complication rate. Very big concern. Uh, particularly the myocarditis that we've seen uh, in young people. So Israel has been a little bit ahead of the boosters. They have basically allowed boosters for everybody. So they looked at 1.5 million people who have received booster shots, and they had only nine cases of myocarditis. And those nine cases were not really in just young people. It was, it was across four different age groups, uh, young, uh, teenagers, uh, middle-aged, and elderly. So it looked really perfectly safe, which is why I believe the Pfizer uh, booster dose was approved. And in, a, in the next couple of weeks, uh, FDA is going to re uh, review booster shots uh, for those 18 and over using uh, Moderna and also for Johnson & Johnson. And also they will be looking at the data for the kids uh, age 5 to 11. So you know, there's one other uh, thing up for approval for the FDA, and that's the mix and match. In other words, you got to uh, vaccinate with Pfizer or Moderna and you get a booster with one or the other. So a lot of information will be coming out of the FDA fairly soon. Uh, there was a really uh, interesting paper, a retrospective analysis that kind of looked at the Pfizer vaccine around infections. And because it's such a large study, I think it's uh, worth uh, looking at. As I mentioned, it was published in The Lancet. It came from uh, Kaiser Permanente, and they looked at 3.5 million people uh, with a median age of 45. And they looked at the overall effectiveness of vaccination against infection and hospitalization. What they found was vaccinated folks were, it was very effective 73% of the time against infections and 90% against hospital admissions. And this is a huge population, three and a half million. 
Interestingly enough, the effectiveness against infection sort of declined. It was, at its height, it was 88% this for Pfizer, and declined by the fifth to sixth month to 47%. And that, again, was the uh, argument for booster shots for Pfizer. But what's interesting is the effectiveness against hospitalizations stayed at 93% through the whole time. Uh, so, you know, one of, we've talked about this a lot, but there are other determinants besides neutralizing antibody memory B cells, memory T cells. And so it may well be that you can get infected, but because you have memory, uh, you, you res respond very quickly so that you don't end up getting very sick and hospitalized. So, I th you know, we don't know enough about that yet, but the main thing is uh, Pfizer was very effective uh, at keeping you out of the hospital. It waned in terms of its ability to prevent infections, which is why the booster shot is approved. Now, this week also was a really important paper, and I think it's going to be a major development uh, in terms of uh, the treatment that we have available. And that was Merck's uh, antiviral. And they, <clears throat> they've been developing a, a, an RNA polymerase inhibitor. You know, in other words, it blocks the ability of the virus to replicate. Uh, and they showed that in a study, uh, a phase three trial, that it reduced hospitalization and death by 50%. So in a phase three trial, 7% of the volunteers in the group received the drug were hospitalized and none died. In the group that got placebo, 14% were hospitalized. So it reduced from 14 to 7%. And they're going to be seeking emergency authorization for that antiviral pill to be used in the United, the United States. And it's really meant for people early on in the infection uh, who are, you know, are sick with COVID but are not yet hospitalized. Uh, and uh, it's really important because those people have early viral replication and, and the idea is that, you know, to use it uh, particularly in high risk groups such as elderly, those who have medical conditions like diabetes or heart disease. So this is very exciting because we've needed this. I think there'll be other drugs that come along, but this one is really uh, showing some real efficacy. As, it's not as effective as the monoclonal antibodies. It's about 50% the efficacy because monoclonal antibodies prevent hospitalizations and death by 85%. This is uh, about half that. But, you know, when you think about it, it's much easier to give a pill than it is to get a monoclonal infusion. And so, actually, this will have, I think, a much bigger impact. Uh, they are planning on making enough for 10 million people. The government has ordered the, and will pay for it. Uh, it's about $700 per course of treatment. So that's very exciting news. It is a little bit like Tamiflu in that you take four ca capsules twice a day for five days, uh, and that's the course of the treatment. And it, it looks very effective. So if you look at antivirals that are, very, uh, that are avail available, you know, remdesivir was the first one that, was, uh, uh, that Gilead made and was used initially. It causes, it's an RNA polymerase inhibitor, and it sort of in, it prevents the, the polymerase from acting. The, the Merck compound is actually very interesting because it introduces mutations that causes the polymerase to make substitutions and mistakes that actually uh, make the virus uh, non-viable. So that's a different strategy, but also a polymerase inhibitor that because it makes, uh, makes the polymerase make errors. In contrast, if you look at Tamiflu, which is an antiviral that works against flu, it binds to a protein, the neuraminidase, and it actually prevents the, the virus from budding. So it's a different mechanism of action, but all of those are very, very effective. And, it's, and, and I think for us to really get um, ahead of this pandemic, we're going to need antiviral medications in, in addition to vaccination. And we're going to have to do a lot better on testing because even though we talked about it, nobody can get a test yet. I mean, it's really hard to get those tests. But those are all very important things we need to use to fight this uh, pandemic. Uh, based on, you know, our friends at uh, the Institute for Health Metrics, we're, we're, we're not seeing much of a change. We're going to be living with this virus, unfortunately, quite, quite some time. And what's sad is we could get rid of it. If everybody got vaccinated, we'd be done with this. Uh, but we're not going to be. So we're going to have to learn to live with it. And I promise you, coming up, I've been talking with Lily, rather than the five-point plan to eliminate the pandemic, we're now going to work on the five-point plan to live with the virus because we're going to have to live with it for a while. But I wanted to end out with some uh, real big shout outs this week. First of all, big shout out to United Airlines. You know, all of us in Houston were very upset when Continental merged with United. You know, we loved Continental Airlines and, and we ended up with United, but United was the first, uh, first big airline to mandate vaccines for their people. So congratulations to them. 
Plus, a lot of big companies are now beginning to mandate. And I, I know it's a tough stand, but thank you for them. Congratulations to Virginia Tech. I never thought I'd say that. But 96, 96% of their students are vaccinated. So, I mean, that's a forward-thinking university. And I also wanted to have a shout out to the PAs, the physician assistants. This is National Physician uh, Assistant Week. And, you know, they're really an important part of our, of our treatment uh, team. We have one of the best programs in the country. We're very proud of our, our physician assistants. And it's their week. So congratulations to them. I also want to recognize Kathleen Gordon, our new chair of pediatrics. She arrived. And I want to do a shout out for the Debakey Awards uh, to Drs. Deneen, El Sali, Kenwal, Lee, and Son, all outstanding scientists at the Baylor College of Medicine. So, so all in all, a pretty, real, pretty good week. Uh, and I want to just say next week we'll maybe be revealing the Lilly Plan. And I can't wait to see you next week.